Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me on this week's episode is Dr. Declan Schroeder. Dr. Schroeder is an associate professor of virology at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Declan, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Super excited to get to chat with you. Um, why don't you start by introducing yourself to the audience in case there's folks out there that haven't met you before? Uh, thanks, Clayton. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I, as you said, I'm a virologist. I'm really interested in all different types of viruses. Um, and for me, you know, the type of host is not that important. More, more about the biology of the virus and how we how we understand how viruses move, how viruses infect. And I've worked on viruses from, from honeybees to, to algae and, and now viruses in swine. Very good. Well, Declan, we're here to talk a little bit about a specific virus, African swine fever, um, one that I know our audience is very familiar with. We're going to talk about transmission of African swine fever. And, um, you know, it's called African swine fever for a reason, um, originates in wild pigs in Africa. And uh, why don't we start there? How, how does this virus like to transmit in its natural host population? Right. Absolutely, Clayton, right? It's, it's, it's called African swine fever because it originates in Africa. And it's, we've known it for a long time, right? We've known it's been there at least over 100 years. Um, and it's pretty harmless in wild, wild pigs. They, they've learned to, to adapt with this virus, and that's actually the rule for most viruses that, that have been around with their host for a long time. They don't cause disease, um, any scale, of, uh, we would understand it as being what we fear from African swine fever now. Um, so it occurs in the natural population. Um, what it does do, it gets transmitted by soft ticks. So you, you have a, a tick that will essentially draw the blood from one animal and then transmit it to, to the next animal. But again, the, the, the association is mild, um, not really um, it causes big harm. The other way of transmission is that um, if a pig dies, it bleeds out, and then the area, the, the, the sort of contamination in the surrounding environment now becomes an avenue for another pig to come who forages, they'll pick it up, and then, and then the disease gets moved on. So you're literally looking at animal-to-animal -animal contact, dead animals contaminating the environment, the ticks, even the ticks themselves, when the ticks die and the ticks are, are resident in the soil, they will be a source of contamination. So those sort of classical um, avenues of vector-borne pick, animal-to-animal -animal contamination, and the environment where the animal dies, that's also an area where the, where the virus gets transmitted. At Essential Ag, pork production is our life. We understand the real-world challenges producers face, and that is why we strive to bring research-driven solutions to the industry. The team at Essential Ag is working hard every day to find and deliver innovative technologies to you because we are passionate about solving your problems. Talk to us about the transmission uh, risk into the United States. What are the potential items that could be contaminated that, that are high risk for introduction of ASF today? Right. So, you know, one of the key components is our, our own domestic swine, right? Our own pigs, are when they come into contact with this virus, they are, um, it, it's, the virus titers are really, really high. And so when you get a virus where, where it shows a lot of disease and the virus titers being high, it means that that, that meat, the, 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 the actual you know, pig itself, is a really good vector for transmission. So the primary route in which a, a virus will move is through contaminated meat. So you can imagine the pressures on a, on a, a farmer or, or a small backyard um, individual who has a pig they can see as not looking too well. They want to slaughter and they want to harvest the meat. So that meat is now in the system. That meat will have really, really high virus loads. And if we, and, and, and that's, you know, considered one of the primary ways in which this virus will move where people take their meat because they, they like the taste of their own meat in their lo a local area and they'll get on the airplane and they'll move it. And so, you know, biosecurity in terms of the first place is our, our airports, our, our shipping docks. We need to make sure that when we as people move in, we make sure that we do not um, bring contaminated meat in. The other way you can think about it as well is that the people who essentially work on farms who are then exposed to these, these animals, um, they will then be carriers 
indirect carriers of these of this virus. So making sure that you know people in terms of and that's classic um, um, sort of protocol within our um, farming communities that you want to be clean. You want to make sure you shower. You make sure you clean. You don't bring clothes or contaminated um, exposures to various compounds where you know that you wear or say clothes or, or or just general materials with you. So I think. In the end, it's what's 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 common is people. We we are the ones that seem to move things around more often than anything else. Yeah, um, Declan, how about uh, once the virus becomes endemic in an area? Um, you know, obviously, you mentioned people. Uh, if they work on farms that are infected, they're likely to become contaminated. Um, but what else in that kind of ecosystem, if you will, of the area is likely to be a concern for contamination of ASF? And then transmission, maybe not with the index case into a country, but moving it around from farm to farm within a country. Right. One of the key messages we know about African swine fever virus is that it is so, so stable. And because it's stable, it doesn't degrade in the environment. So unlike common flu or, or like you know, influenza, we know once it gets out of the animal, it'll degrade very rapidly. With African swine fever virus, it actually is very, very stable. So once it's in an environment, you can consider it there for a very long time. Um, and so that's the sort of renewal and continual exposure of this virus to a, a system where they, you know, it might not be as obvious like a, um, a piece of meat or blood product that's sitting there. It can literally be as just a surface touch contamination. Um, and that, that then triggers a new, new environment, right? So things like like um, things that you, would, you wouldn't necessarily think to be associated with the animals. So, for example, feed. So the, the feed, growing feed, where that feed comes from, who is in contact with the feed can, can give a, you know, a, a new route of contamination. And then when the feed gets onto the farm, then you have a, a, a possibility of, of that virus moving in. So you can think of all these combinations, but it's quite a complicated story, Clayton, right? Because it's not just about, oh, is the virus present, which is more likely it would be um, if that area is contaminated. It's more about the dose, right? What's the minimum amount of virus required to cause disease? And that becomes a big, big problem because we really don't know. Yeah, I think that's a, an excellent point, Declan. Do you know, Declan, is there active research into that area? Is that something we're going to learn more about? Or is it an area we need to research, but we need to start the process? It's not in, in ongoing right now. Oh, it is an active area. I mean, there's some preliminary data that's coming out where you see that you need one virus particle in water to cause an infection, um, or you need like 10,000 from feed, and that's been demonstrated. But then you also get other data that shows, well, you can repeatedly feed pigs 100,000 viruses on a daily basis, and you don't get disease. So the context is not only about the infectious dose, it's the context of the virus in the environment it's in. So yeah, this is this. We only got you know a few studies looked at this, but certainly more work needs to be needs to be done to trying to unravel the complexities of this. And it becomes it's a really complicated area, and it's because, to be honest, feed is a, a an area that's not really been looked at. And you mentioned PDV. PDV is now considered one of the, the routes when it entered the U.S. to cause the pandemic, as was likely to do to feed. And so we really need to understand the complexity around feed and its transmission of viruses. Very good. Fascinating stuff, Declan. I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing with us and to our audience. Thanks for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com. Check out the website. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on our next episode. For Dr. Declan Schroeder, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your week. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.